All metronomes have the same set of tempos on them. These are the standard metronome markings, and they never change. And you might notice that there are some tempos missing from this list. Like, for example, 70 BPM isn't on here. It just goes 69, nice, to 72. Why is that? Well, when metronomes were first invented, they were mechanical timepieces. And a fine gradation of tempo, like 1 BPM, might not be super practical using the clockwork machinery of the era. But we live here in the year 2022, and we can use digital audio workstations to calculate BPM down to the decimal point. So why do we still use the standard metronome markings which were first invented several hundred years ago? Well, to answer that question, we're going to need to plumb the depths of human perception itself, and also explore the changing relationship of sheet music and social media. And in doing so, we'll figure out just why this BPM is cringe. <laughs> This video was brought to you by CuriosityStream and my streaming service Nebula, where you can watch a bonus video where I review threatening music notation. Part 1. Perception of Time So in a recent video, my Sungazer bandmate Sean Crowder conducted an informal study into the perception of microrhythm, the tiny variations in timing which help give music its feel. He wanted to figure out just how subtle our perception of that timing truly is. Can we actually perceive these differences on a conscious level, and to what extent do we have to rely on feeling and intuition? He had participants listen to four even pulses, followed by a fifth one, which was either slightly early or slightly late. Like this, I'm going to play you four pulses, and then I want you to figure out whether the fifth pulse is early or late. Here we go. In this case, the fifth pulse came 100 milliseconds too early, which is relatively easy to detect. Sean found that his participants could reliably detect timing discrepancies of 100 milliseconds, which is really, really fast. That's faster than the blink of an eye. Any faster than 100 milliseconds, though, it became a lot harder. Can you tell whether or not the fifth pulse is too early or too late in this example? Hmm, that one is... That one's difficult. In psychology, the threshold for noticing a change in stimulus is called the just noticeable difference. It's how much something needs to change for you to notice that it changed. This is generally pegged at a 75% success rate, meaning that if you notice something changed three out of four times, you're probably not guessing. Probably. Looking at Sean's results, we can say that the just noticeable difference for beat detection is about 30 milliseconds, which is very interesting because that reflects the standard metronome markings. 69 BPM, nice, is a click occurring once every 869 milliseconds. 72 BPM is a click occurring once every 833 milliseconds, or a 36 millisecond difference, right at the threshold of beat perception. A more formal study of tempo change cited the just noticeable difference at roughly 3 BPM, give or take. 69 BPM and 72 are separated by 3 beats per minute. So even though metronome markings might have first started because of mechanical reasons, we've kept them around as the standard because they represent the finest gradation of tempo that humans can reliably detect. We just can't tell the difference between 69 and 70 BPM. This is a set of tempos that we can use to reliably relate to the world around us, which is something that we do all the time. We often sacrifice precision in the name of understanding. Like, for example, a weather person would probably not say that it's 31.5 degrees outside. They'd probably just say it's 32 degrees outside. And it might be kind of confusing if they were measuring the weather down to the decimal point. I probably wouldn't say that I got to the party at 6.42 p.m. because that's not how we generally parse longer units of time. We generally round to the nearest 15 minute mark, so I'd probably say that I got to the party at 6.45 p.m. If I said that I got to the party at 6.42 p.m., you might be a little suspicious. Why is he telling the time down to the minute? Does he need an alibi? Is that why he's saying 6.42? To be precise in this way almost changes the meaning of the measurement which is why I am so suspicious of tempos with decimal points in them. Because, to me, it represents somebody who's more concerned with being precise and right rather than musical. Why would you do something like that? Part two, why you would do something like that. 
Score Follower is a TikTok account which transcribes viral sounds into Western notation, which ends up looking more or less like complicated contemporary classical music. It's very cool and very fun. I like this a lot. Score Follower recently had a Twitter thread defending the use of decimal points in tempos. One obvious example where this might be useful is in film and television and maybe video games where the music needs to precisely match the visual. So if something happens exactly 15 seconds after the music starts, you're gonna wanna precisely calculate the tempo of the music, maybe down to the decimal point to avoid desynchronization. DJs might also have use for very fine gradations of tempo. Very smooth tempo shifts can help keep the dance floor moving while a DJ transitions between tracks with different tempos. The fact that your brain can't detect this shift is kind of the point. You could also calculate precise tempo to match the acoustic interference patterns created by different chords and harmony, which is an idea. But the main thrust of Score Follower's argument comes down to transcribing viral sounds and sheet music for social media. For example, the chromatic music teacher is an account of a music teacher who plays boom whackers. It's awesome and delightful. She has a fun video where she plays all of her boom whackers in an ascending chromatic scale at the rate of one boom whacker per frame at 60 frames per second, or literally 60 notes per second. 60 notes per second is ludicrously fast. A score follower explains, you can think of it as quarter notes at 3600 BPM, half the tempo, and it's eighth notes at 1800 BPM, 16ths at 900 BPM, 30 seconds at 450 BPM, 64ths at 225 BPM, or 128th notes at 112.5 BPM. The math doesn't lie. If you want to accurately transcribe what she's doing, you might need to use a decimal point in the notation. 128th notes at 112.5 BPM. There are a total of 43 boom whackers though, which doesn't really fit into convenient time signatures since Western notation is generally built in powers of two. So score follower elected to transcribe it has a 43 against 32 polyrhythm in two four, where the quarter note equals 167.44 BPM. Hilariously precise. Part of the fun of seeing music notation this complex is subverting expectations of musical virtuosity, like you would expect some grand display of physical prowess. But the way that the chromatic music teacher made this video has nothing to do with a 43 against 32 polyrhythm. She just cut up different clips of boom whackers and arranged them at 60 frames per second on a final cut timeline. Except it is a 43 against 32 polyrhythm at 167.44 BPM. So is the sheet music right? I mean, it's precise, but is it right? This speaks to a fundamental divide in what music notation is and who it's for, the performer or the audience. They aren't the same. Part three, what even is musical notation? Okay, so as a performer, I like to think of sheet music as like a recipe. It's not the food itself, it's like the steps necessary to get to the point where you have food. All the stuff that's on this page is like instructions, where your hands need to go, in what order, so that music comes out. Kind of like a recipe, all the stuff that you need to do to make the food. It's not the food itself, it's what you need to do to make the food. At some point, you'll have the recipe memorized, so you won't need to look at the recipe anymore while you make the music. And writing down the recipe technically isn't even necessary to make the music. You could have somebody else teach you the recipe without writing it down, or you could watch somebody make the music and, Man, this food analogy is going too far. The point is, is that the instructions on the page, all these dots, are somehow meaningful for the performer. Sheet music is a set of meaningful instructions for a performer, and this, this is meaningless, the same way that preheating the oven to 361.42 degrees would be meaningless for a human cook. It's just kind of ridiculous. There's no need and often ability to be that precise with your temperature control, so why would you put it in the recipe? But for an audience, this marking might give insight into some aspect of the music that the performer just didn't consider or didn't need to know. In that way, notation is a form of analysis, less so a recipe. It's a visual aid that in some way pairs our sense of hearing with our sense of sight that hopefully gives us a deeper understanding about what the music is. Hopefully, anyway. Because of the visual nature of this, notation has proven very popular on social media. There's been a recent explosion of transcription videos, like from George Collier, for example. Even though the performers in these videos often didn't use notation since the music was improvised, the notation becomes another way for the audience to engage with the sound of music. I use music notation all the time in my music analysis videos. The point isn't to teach you how to play these songs, although you could pause the video and play them on guitar or whatever. Instead, it's a way of coaxing you into a deeper hearing of the music. Or at least, 
the hearing that I want you to hear. See, one of the things that's not talked about that often is that music notation is always coming from somebody's perspective, their viewpoint, or I guess, ear point. Somebody wrote down the things that they wanted you to hear in the music. Keep that in mind. In 2018, fellow YouTuber Samurai Guitarist and I gave a performance of John Cage's 4 minutes and 33 seconds. In this infamous piece, the performers sit on a stage with their instruments but do not play their instruments, and instead, the ambient sound of the audience and the room is framed as music. So all of the creaking of the chairs, the coughs of the audience members, whatever's going on outside, that is now the music that you're supposed to experience. Now for some people, even the most open-minded ones, that is a hard pill to swallow. It's hard to hear ambient sound as music. So I transcribed our performance in musical notation. The shifting in our seats, the bass player playing in the next room over, the white noise from the video equipment, all of it was written down in sheet music. I think this kind of transcription almost makes it easier for people to hear sound as music. Like, it gives people permission to hear ambient sounds, things that they might not typically think of as musical as having some kind of musical legitimacy if you're seeing it on the score. That was a good take. That was a good take, we nailed it. So when you take a viral sound, like this one, <coughs> and you slap some sheet music on it, it gives it an air of musical legitimacy. It's the same sound, but well, you can clearly see there's sheet music now, so it's music. I mean, yeah, kinda. In addition to being like super fun, I think this transcription almost puts forth an argument for the inherent musicality of sound. And the way that it does it is it uses notation to quantify aspects of the sound, like quantifying its pitch, quantifying its rhythm, quantifying its tempo trying to almost find objective qualities in the sound so nobody can argue that it isn't music. In this way, the transcriptions aren't really recipes, like instructions on how to play music, although they can be used that way. Instead, they're like a detailed list of a sound's observable, calculable musical attributes. By writing down as much information as you possibly can, like decimal points and tempos, for example, or absurd polyrhythms, you're expressing more and more musical detail and sound. And there might be some problems with that. Part four. And there might be some problems with that. Western music notation is not very precise. It's very imprecise at measuring volume. We just say loud, soft, kind of loud, kind of soft, as loud as possible, as soft as possible. It's bad at expressing pitch. Pitch is a continuum, but Western notation is very much locked to the 12 equal tempered tones of the piano. It doesn't express any of the complexities of timbre or tone color at all. It doesn't express musical relationships, like whether or not a note is the third of the key. And it doesn't have any expression on how your body might react to sound, how you might dance to sound, or how you might emotionally react to sound. No matter how much detail you add to a transcription using Western notation, you're you're always gonna be missing something, always some musical aspect that you won't capture because it's inherently a lossy format. So, some context here. Remember that bass solo that I made you listen to earlier? If I had a dime for every time I said that to an ex, well. Woo! The solo starts off with a 16th note pickup up to a high E, which lands on the beat of the first measure. But if you take a look at the waveform of the recording, that high E actually occurs a 16th note off the grid. It's a 16th note syncopation. It occurs on the second 16th note of the beat. It observably does not occur on the downbeat, so why did I write it as if it did? Well, I know how I felt that note. I know that I felt it as if it was on the downbeat, just delayed. Which is a very common thing for the style. You want to lay back on certain melodic notes. I like the sound of the push and the pull of different downbeats not lining up. It sounds really nice in the style. 
So if you transcribe the music like this, with the 16th note occurring off the beat, which you can see in the Digital Audio Workstation, it might be more precise, but it would be wrong, because it ignores the broader musical context of what the note meant. This is kind of like saying you got to the party at 742 versus 745. They mean different things depending on the level of precision. Like while it might be accurately measured as a 43 against 32 polyrhythm at 167.44 BPM, it's not really my experience of this TikTok, and I don't think it's really anybody's experience. Like, because it's going by so fast, I'm not hearing every individual pitch, and I'm not hearing every individual rhythm. I'm hearing like, like two little pulses followed by a sound. Like, you know, that's how I'm hearing it. I'd probably just transcribe this sound like this which obviously wouldn't get as many views. Everybody knows that polyrhythms get the clicks, but I don't know if you need that level of detail. Scorefaller suggests that this level of detail is necessary to preserve the idiosyncrasies of recordings and samples that composers use in new music, which I don't really agree with, because the recording's gonna preserve those idiosyncrasies way better than notation ever could, and this intricacy of notation doesn't really reflect anybody's experience of the sound itself. It might give insight into how the sound was created, in this case, the chromatic music teacher taking 43 boomwhackers and playing it back at 60 frames per second. But even then, I'm sure there are clearer ways of notating that workflow than is represented by this particular sheet music. Put it simply, <laughs> notation doesn't tell you how the music sounds. Sometimes the most obvious, glaringly obvious things in sound just are not reflected in the notation. Like for example, what does this sound like? Like, what does this sound like to you? To me, it sounds kind of like a weiro or some kind of percussion instrument. No matter how detailed the transcription is, it's not gonna tell you that. You gotta use your ears to hear music. Yeah. Do you remember that second time where I had you listen to the four clicks followed by a fifth click that was either too early or too late? Well, it turns out that fifth click was five milliseconds too late. It is far beneath the average just noticeable difference. Maybe you could tell, I know I certainly wouldn't be able to. But that doesn't mean that if you wanted to, you couldn't represent that in music notation. And in this case, that five millisecond difference ends up being a 512th note off the downbeat at 100 beats per minute, which is just hilarious. You can quantify anything, even if you can't hear it. So it does seem a little ridiculous that I've made a whole YouTube video essay on why I don't like decimal points and tempos, because honestly, if you want to use them, you do you. And I think accounts like Score Follower do great work in engaging mass audiences on social media and trying to get them to hear the musicality of sound. It's good stuff, honestly. But that doesn't change the fact that because they exist beyond humans' ability to perceive them, tempos with decimal points in them, for me anyway, are a form of musical notation that has a vaguely threatening aura about them. It's like you could say, I got to the party at 745, but you chose to say, I got to the party at 742. Why are you saying that? Seems suspicious. Speaking of threatening music notation, there's a bonus video over on Nebula, the creator-owned streaming service where I react to a variety of other threatening music notation from the threatening music notation Twitter account, like the notation that we talked about today. You can find other bonus content of mine over on Nebula, as well as some fantastic music creators like Charles Cornell, Mary Spender, Sounds Good, Listening In, Amy Nolte, and many others from other educational niches. It's a fantastic place to watch and discover quality content ad-free, as well as support your favorite creators. Now, Nebula and this video is brought to you by another great streaming service, CuriosityStream, the go-to source on the internet for the very best cinematic documentaries with thousands of titles to choose from, including Stradivarius, Mysteries of the Supreme Violin, an in-depth and scientific look on what makes the Stradivarius instruments just so special and so sought after by musicians around the world. If you're interested in quality content like this, you can click the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash Adam Neely. And when when you sign up, you'll also get a subscription to Nebula for free. For a limited time, you'll get 
get both streaming services for 26% off or $14.79 per year. When you sign up today for this Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle, you're not only supporting this channel, but all of the creators over at Nebula as we create content that aims to engage the world in a more meaningful way. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Peace.